Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the forum today. Today we have an absolutely marvelous topic. And you know, it's really interesting. The forum has been around for 60 years. Yes, this is our 60th birthday for those of you that don't know that. And, and you know, it, it, somebody said I don't even look 60. I really like that person. Anyway, the forum is 60 years. And today we have um, two very special guests. We have two people with us from Pacific University checking us out. We have Stephanie Sokhammer uh, and uh, her assistant, Brevin McCartney. Could you just kind of wave? Hi, thank you very much for being here, folks. One of the things we hope to do is develop a stronger relationship with Pacific, and we're very, very pleased to have these two folks here today. And today, you know, this organization has been growing. In 60 years, we've had anywhere from, oh, I don't know, 20 members to 160 members. And at the start of this year, we had somewhere in the neighborhood of 50. I believe the count today is 70, well, must be 73 because we have a renewal today. Uh, the Beaverton Chamber of Commerce Executive Director, Lorraine Clarno, who will be kind enough to wave too, just renewed her membership today. Nice to have you back. Ladies and gentlemen, that's enough self-aggrandizing. Well, actually, it's never enough self-aggrandizing stuff about the forum because we're pretty cool. Today, we're going to talk about the upcoming ballot measure. We have an interesting format today. We're going to have the pro present for 20 minutes and open up for 10 minutes or so of questions. And then we'll have the other side present for 20 minutes. Um, and we'll have 10 minutes for questions. And folks, there's something happening here. There's a phenomenon. There's a there's some really intelligent people in this room. You know who you are. And you ask really intelligent questions. Let me just ask if you can phrase your question in the form of a question so that it could kind of get out a little faster. Some folks have a habit of making very intelligent and interesting speeches to the point that we're seriously considering asking some of them to come and present to the forum. But when you're asking a question, if you could be as succinct as possible, most of the room would be incredibly grateful, as would our speakers. Ladies and gentlemen, without taking any more time to meander around issues or even to talk directly about them, it's our pleasure today to welcome Ben Unger from our Oregon. Ladies and gentlemen. Please. Rob's shorter than I am, as are most people. That's good. That's good. Thanks, Eric. Hi, everyone. My name is Ben Unger, and I'm the executive director of Our Oregon. Um, before I was a, the executive director at Our Oregon, I grew up in Hillsborough and actually grew up on a farm. If you keep on going out Farmington until it ends, you basically run into the, the family farm. Um, so I'm glad to be here at the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. I got a chance to be here before. It's good to see a bunch of old friends. Um, I, I want to spend my time today talking to you about why it's so important that we find new money to invest in schools and services in the state of Oregon. Uh, if, how many people here had kids in public school in Washington County or have kids in public school? Um, I, I went to Hillsborough High School, um, and 25 years ago, frighteningly enough, when I was in high school, I'd argue that we had some of the, the best darn schools in the country. Um, you, you know, I, I feel like I got a great education. I, I had a good enough education to where I got to take the electives I wanted. I got to go to a, the, you know, the college of my dreams. I got to... Um, get scholarships and be engaged in extra curricular activity. I, I got a lot. And I graduated in 1994, though, three or four years after the impacts of Measure 5. And what we've seen for the last 25 years has been a constant bleeding out of our public schools. And if you go to Hillsborough High School today, while it is still a wonderful place and maybe one of the greatest places on earth, it, it doesn't offer the kids today what it offered me when I was there so long ago. And if you, and I'm sure you have your own visions of what our schools are like today, but if you ask a parent who has a kid in third or fourth grade about whether or not their kids are getting the best education they can in the world, they'll tell you no. They'll say their class sizes are too big, 
that the, that the courses they used to have aren't there anymore, the opportunities for the kids aren't there anymore, and if there are opportunities, they have to pay, and then they have to pay, and then they have to pay, and that's, that's not what our kids deserve, it's not what our communities need, it's not what our economy needs to be successful. And we have talked for years about fixing this problem. In the 90s, we talked about fixing this problem with sales taxes. I don't know if anyone was around um, and remembers um, how successful those sales tax ballot measures were. Um, wildly successful uh, is the answer. In the early 2000s, we tried again by trying to increase income taxes with measures 28 and 30. Again, not very close to being successful. And so we find ourselves here today with a revenue problem that was created 25 years ago where we don't have enough money for the things that we all agree that we need um, and still no solution about how to pay for them. And the, the reason why I talk about all that as an introduction is because the proposal that we're talking about today, Initiative Petition 28, is a solution to this 25-year problem of not having the resources our schools and services really need. And to start that conversation, so that's kind of the background from my personal perspective, but to, to start this conversation, you really have to start talking about who pays and who doesn't pay taxes in Oregon. Oregonians, for the most part, you and I, we pay our fair share of taxes. Um, our income taxes are, as a rate, one of the highest in the country because we don't pay sales taxes here, so we, we pay a lot of income taxes, our property taxes are, relatively high, we do our fair part. And if corporations in the state of Oregon did their fair part as well, we would actually have enough money to pay for the things that we really need. The problem is, in Oregon, oops, wrong way, corporate taxes here are lower than any other place in the country, and not by a little bit, by a lot. Oregon's taxes are, are literally the lowest in the country according to the Anderson Economic Group. And in order for Oregon to catch 49, to catch Louisiana, we would have to raise our tax, taxes on corporations by $1.5 billion a year. $1.5 billion just to go from 50th to 49th. That's how out of whack Oregon's corporate tax structure is in comparison to the rest of the country. Why is it so out of whack? For the most part, it's out of whack because Oregon's minimum taxes are very low and most corporations pay just the minimum. Just a hair under 70% of the corporations that do business in Oregon, the C corporations that do business, I should say, do just, pay just the minimum in taxes. And the bigger the corporation gets, the less it pays in taxes. And so we have this perverse system where the local small businesses that I think Oregon takes pride in, kind of how we define ourselves as a community, are the ones that do more than their fair share, while the largest corporations in the world aren't doing their fair part. And what, what that does is leave us with this hole. Um, so let's talk about what that hole looks like. So, so it's a hole that affects every single sector of our schools and our services. It starts with kids who aren't even in school yet, those preschool kids, and goes all the way to our seniors. We don't have Oh, sorry, I was on the wrong slide. Again, this, I'm trying to get used to this little mousey thing. Um, let's talk about K-12 for a second. Oregon has the third largest class sizes in the country. We have one of the shortest school years in the country. We have one of the lowest graduation rates in the country, partially because we have third largest class size in one, in one of the shortest school years. And if we, Experts say that if we wanted to fund our schools at the average level, get our schools to be average for the country, we would need to invest $2 billion more a biennium in our K-12 school system, $2 billion more. And that's a, that, that amount has been, we've been under the kind of average expectation for our schools for years, and we're still struggling to get there. That's our K-12 system. Our healthcare system, it's just, as, it's just as bad. There are nearly 400,000 Oregonians that despite all of the advancement, we've made so much progress on healthcare over the last 10 years. Um, we, we're covering more Oregonians than ever before when it comes to healthcare, but there are still 400,000 Oregonians that don't have healthcare insurance. Healthcare prices continue to go up, and despite the fact that 
again, we're making progress on healthcare. Healthcare-related problems are still the number one leading cause of bankruptcy for Oregon families. So when people fall into trouble, it's because they can't afford to pay their medical bills. It's no way to, to, to take care of our community. And then when you look at seniors and the help that seniors need, our senior population in Oregon is going to grow. It's going to grow by a lot over the next couple of decades. While the population is growing, the, our seniors' ability to, to save for their retirement has gone down as wages have stagnated. And now, over the last 10 years, we're seeing poverty among seniors, a problem that was one of maybe the greatest accomplishments of the 20th century was us addressing senior poverty and actually helping to eradicate a lot of the senior poverty. We're now seeing poverty rates rise. Poverty, poverty rates among seniors are up 27% since 2007. So this is the picture that I have to paint for you, which is not a new picture for all of you. Our schools are struggling because they're underfunded. Our healthcare system is too expensive. It drives too many people into bankruptcy and not enough people have quality healthcare coverage. Our senior population is growing. Seniors have less money than they had a few years ago, and their needs are gonna to continue to grow over the next handful of years. Oregon is, lags far behind when it comes to funding kids in early education. We have 30,000 kids in head, who are eligible for Head Start that don't have the money to be able to go to a preschool, or a reduced preschool, so they can actually get the head, the head Start they need to succeed in life. We've got problems. And it's long overdue, 25 years overdue, that we actually do something about them. So this year, a group of parents, teachers, small businesses, healthcare advocates, mental health advocates got together and proposed a ballot measure that would once and for all address those problems by making the largest corporations that do business in the state of Oregon pay their fair share in taxes. The initiative is called Initiative Petition 28, and it does a really simple thing. It increases the corporate minimum tax when sales exceed $25 million in Oregon sales for C corporations in the state of Oregon. Um, it sets a new minimum for those companies that for everything that they sell above 25 million, they pay 2.5% on their sales above that. And it finally raises the money that we need to pay for these services that I think most of us, if you don't think we need more money for services, that's fine. You won't like our proposal if you don't think we need more money. But if you do think we need more money, the, it raises enough money to actually make the investments that our community needs to have good schools. To, for, if you're a parent, to be proud to send your kid into a classroom that doesn't have 35, 40 for, uh, first, uh, fourth graders there. It, it, it actually makes investments in our community. And it's designed in a way to protect Oregon businesses while we make the companies, the largest companies in the world, pay. So about 1,000 companies will pay this tax, and they're the biggest companies that you can think of. Any company that does more than $25 million of dollars in sales in Oregon would pay the tax, and there are companies like Comcast and Bank of America and Walmart, Pfizer, Kroger, U.S. Bank. Um, these are the companies that will end up footing the bill, finally, I would argue, finally footing the bill for these services that they have kind of been skirting and avoiding for years. I mean, like I said, Oregon has the lowest corporate taxes in the country, and because our taxes are so low, um, these businesses have really been able to make a higher amount of profit here than other places. So. Let's assume that it's November 9th, and we've just won the campaign, and we're now looking back to thinking, what could we fund with these new resources? What, what's the, what are the possibilities when we think about passing a measure that would actually give the state of Oregon the resources it needs to fund schools and services? It, here's a couple of things. We could fund preschool for all third and fourth, uh, thir three and four year olds. We could actually fund a program that would allow all of our kids to get that basic early education that so many other states are providing for their families. We could have an K-12 system that was funded at the quality education model, the state, the, the place where experts say is needed if we want to be, be providing our kids a quality, high value public education. We could provide healthcare for every Oregonian and make sure every Oregonian has, has the insurance they need. 
and we could start to fund senior programs that help lift seniors out of poverty, make them self-sustaining, and make sure that they have a healthy and long retirement. Those are the kinds of things that we could do if we pass IP28 in the fall. So what can you do? How can you help? So we're in the middle of our petition drive right now. We, um, the, if you're, you're not following along because it's a little bit early in the campaign cycle, um, petition and, uh, signatures are due for ballot measures in July. July 8th is our deadline. So we're about halfway done gathering the signatures we need to qualify. The first thing you could do if you're um, the petition gathering type is to come join our, our, our growing and excited team of volunteers who are going out basically every day at this point, gathering signatures all around the state. Um, we'd love your help. If that's more than you're ready to do right now, you can tell your friends about us on Facebook. You can tell your friends about us um, on social media. Um, and you can start talking to people about what they would imagine they would do if they had the basic funding they needed for the services they care about. And, and I go back to that because I, I, that's what we're really talking about here. If you lived in Oregon for any period of time at all, You've heard the story about what we did to our schools, to our services when we passed Measure 5 25 years ago. We've never replaced the money that was lost there. And because we haven't replaced it, we've left an entire generation without the basic support it needs to succeed. We have a chance now to reinvest in our kids and our families. And I'm really hopeful that we take this opportunity and drive the state forward to a better tomorrow for everyone. So with that, I think I'm about on time. And Rob, I'll let you um, coordinate the questioning. Yep, I'm still shorter. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ben. I really appreciate that excellent case was made. We appreciate it very much. Folks, as a reminder, only paid up forum members can ask, ask questions, so please feel free to line up over here. And if you are not a paid up member of the forum, and I know you have a burning question, we have our executive director over there who takes money really well from anybody. Other folks can, but he just does it really, really well. Again, thank you, Ben, and I believe we're lining up for questioners. And great. Thanks again. Mike Mahalik, uh, forum member. Uh, ben, thanks very much for your presentation. Uh, Two-part question. First one, do you have a tax accountant on your board? No. 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 Second question is related to the first one. Um, the, ta the tax will be assessed on people, companies who have more than $25 million in revenue in Oregon sales. So the question is, who would pay more in taxes if this measure passes? New Seasons Market or a large semiconductor company in Washington County? Well, you know, the, 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 those are two good questions. Um, I, New Seasons wouldn't pay this tax because they're not a C corporation, they're an LLC, and so they, they won't pay um, at all. And um, I'm pretty sure if you're talking about Intel, the, Intel doesn't have a lot of sales in the state of Oregon. I don't know, you have to ask Intel. They, they won't tell you what their, their current tax bill is or how they pay it um, or how much sales they have in Oregon, but mm -hmm. Intel would be the, the person you have to ask. M my gut is that they won't pay a lot. Okay, and then you also had United on there. Uh, yeah. As far as I know, United has no sales in Oregon either. I, my understanding is, and I'm pretty sure this is right, that when you buy your plane ticket here, that's a, a United sale here in the state of Oregon. It's not, it's, it's a sale outside of Oregon. Well, that's so, where you and I disagree, but that's, that's cool. We can disagree. I encourage I'm, you, if you want to have any credence to the information you presented to the various audiences, please have a forensic tax accountant to understand how taxes and sales are made in the state of Oregon. Um, just because we don't have a tax accountant on our board, we have been working really closely with Legislative Revenue Office to have a good idea of who pays these taxes. So um, thank you, though, for your comment. Um, Jim Cape, four member. The media said there would be another presenter to present the opposite side. Jim, just because you weren't here when we started. Okay. Uh, it will be at 1230. You'll be, the other side will be here. Okay. Um, the concern is that, I mean, you're from West County. That's very one-sided and easy, but I mean, you're talking about 
adding extra money to the school budget, mm -hmm. but there's no guarantee that that money will actually go to the school budget. And there's no guarantee that if it actually goes to the school budget, that the state legislature won't just not fund school budget for that amount. So it seems like using children as easy PR props is just so cheesy and is such pandering because no one is held accountable. Well, Thank you. I I appreciate the question because I do think that's the added, that's part two of this campaign. We have, to, we have to win the campaign to make sure we have the money that we need for our schools. But just winning the campaign and getting the, the money available doesn't mean the money gets spent in the way that our communities demand. So part one is winning, part two is going down to the legislature and holding our legislators accountable to spending the money well. And if you only do the first part, you might not like the results, but if you do both, I think we can have this kind of schools that we all feel like we deserve. So good question, thank you. Uh, Bill Kroger, forum member. Thanks for coming in, Ben, appreciate your talk. Um, I, I don't know if you have anything to do with this or not, but I was curious uh, what's going on with the kicker issue. You know, I heard they were trying to turn it back, uh, which would put a lot, quite a bit of money back. And also I think the corporate kicker was turned back already. Maybe yep. you could confirm that. So my, um, thanks Bill for the question. Um, our Oregon has been involved with trying to solve, do kicker reform for a long time. And in 2012, we qualified ballot measure 85, I think it was, which, um, which turned back the corporate kicker and made sure that any money that was that um, that would have normally gone back to corporations actually got kicked back to K-12 schools, and so um, we're really proud of that change. Um, we've had a harder time convincing the general public that turning back the personal kicker is an equally good idea. Um, we continue to work. I think lots of people really believe that it's hard to budget long term when you have the kicker set up the way that you do that really removes your opportunity to have a reasonable rainy day fund, and lots of people want to make that reform happen, but until we can convince voters that it needs to happen, we can't make that progress. And so we're working on that. It's a long-term educational campaign. But there, ha there isn't a current proposal right now, Bill, to go to the ballot with su um, substantial kicker reform. I think that we're all still looking for the right policy that both meets our needs um, from, from, a, from a budget perspective and actually fits into what the public is demanding as far as accountability with the kicker. It, it's, it, it, it's a challenge in that way. John Blackman, forum member. Your tax, I understand, will be on gross receipts, not profits? That's correct, sir. Many of those corporations that look like the inviting targets actually borrow a lot of money. Have you contacted Wells Fargo, Bank of America, and Chase and asked them, would this make them more willing to lend money they don't care or less willing to lend money. I, I have not called and asked them whether or not it would make them more willing or less willing to lend money, but you bring up a good question that I'd like to address about why focus on gross receipts rather than profits. And the challenge is, is that increasingly over the last couple of decades, corporations have done a better and better job of hiding their profits. So right now, Bloomberg News says over $2 trillion in corporate profits are being held in overseas accounts so they can't be taxed by, um, by states and the federal government, even though that's money that's been made here. Um, and um, that's not wrong. O President Obama says, calls those companies unpatriotic, um, which, which I think uh, is, is pretty apt. And um, the, one of the reasons why our current tax structure doesn't work is because we actually have a profits-based tax with a rate that is, is, rel is relatively high, but because Corporations have gotten better and better and better at hiding their profits. Um, it becomes basically impossible to use that as a metric to figure out what they should pay. Gross receipts is actually a really great way to look at it because it measures the activity of a business in the state. Like Walmart puts a lot of strain on our infrastructure in the state. Their employees need to send their kids to school someplace. And Walmart's not paying those bills right now and they should, and so the idea here is to make companies like Walmart that put a big infrastructure strain on our state's budgets to pay their fair share, and that's what we're trying to do. But thanks for the question, John. Chris, keep it fast, please. I will. Won't companies just raise their costs for products by the amount that you're going to tax them? No, I actually don't think that they, they will, sir. And, and one of the reasons why is because 
most of these companies that we're taxing still have to compete with the, the small businesses in the state of Oregon that over the, you know, over the years, these large global companies have been able to come in and cut, undercut small businesses on our main streets by, re, by basically just driving down their prices to where they, the, the small businesses can't compete. And now what we're doing is finally saying for once, okay, we're gonna make these large corporations pay their fair share and it gives these small businesses a chance to actually compete on a more level playing field. And one of the cool things about this initiative is that, cool is a, such a technical term, um, that only about 40% of the sales in the state are, are taxed by this measure. And because such a small percentage of the overall sales are taxed, what it does is it creates this ongoing competition that forces these companies to eat more of the costs and pass less of them on to consumers. And um, that, that's one of the reasons why we designed it by only having the large companies pay. It was designed to target those small set of companies that could really afford it and spare the small businesses at the same time. Is that it, Rob? Okay, thank you all. Thank you again, tall person. Uh, really, Ben, thank you very much. A good presentation, and thanks for answering those questions. Ladies and gentlemen, as Jim pointed out, the forum has a history of trying to present two sides to every story. Every now and then, we run up against a story that has three or four sides, but when there's two, we do our best to present two. When there's four, we try and find four. This is the beginning stages of the campaign, as Ben referred to, and when we were looking for an, an opposing point of view, we actually struggled for a while, but not only did we find the organization, and um, it's called, it's, they changed their name since we connected with them, and the organization is Defeat the Tax on Oregon Sales. And representing that point of view today, we have Ryan Deckert from the Oregon Business Association. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you. We have a theme going now of uh, tall to small. Uh, well, it is, um, it's really great to be with everyone here. Uh, I think driving out here, I thought, gosh, I'm going to see a lot of familiar faces from my, where I started in my life, my political life, and actually my story when Ben was telling his story, I thought, well, there's a lot of similarities. Um, from graduating in the public schools here uh, in Beaverton, uh, to going to a public university, uh, to now my kids, my three children, all attend public schools. And so I would share generally, and if you look at the last two decades, most of my uh, life and activity has been centered around a better public education system uh, for the state. And so. A good cause, which um, Ben certainly talked at length about, does not ensure that you have to swallow a, a very, very costly bad idea. Because I would have joined him in the cause of a phenomenal public education system, a phenomenal higher education system, and Representative Barker's here, and we made some progress, and I just want to correct a couple quick points. Uh, uh, we actually moved into the 23rd in the country, according to the NEA, the Teachers Union, it's on their website, uh, funding for public education. So we did make some progress. We're above the national average, and that doesn't take into account great places like Beaverton that do local options. So we were able to even move the needle more. But certainly, work needs to continue in terms of public education funding, higher ed, Oregon Story. Obviously, much more work needs to be done there. And we've been spending too much incarcerating Oregonians, and not, in general, uh, enough on education. Having said that, I think you'll notice in a 30-minute presentation, I'm not sure we spent any time, I printed a copy, talking about the topic, which is IP28. If this was a complete discussion about a better school system, a better higher education system, doing important things for seniors and for um, health care, where Oregon actually ranks generally in the top three states in the country in terms of outcomes and investment, um, we could have a great session, but what the proponents, and I'm not sure if Ben's here or not, um, are proposing is the largest tax increase, obviously in Oregon history. It's a five billion plus tax increase, not just in Oregon history. We're now looking anywhere ever in any state 
has a per capita, obviously like California on a size, you know, size basis has done, but has anyone ever proposed on a per capita basis a tax increase of this magnitude? And the one thing, and some of the folks that ask questions, so I, I encourage you to print, print the initiative off, because what we're finding is folks don't really want to talk about what's actually in this. And the first thing that you will find, and you'll find it, you only have to go six words into it, is it's not a tax on, on profits. I, I know about taxes on profits. I chaired the Senate Finance Committee. The organization that I represent, the Oregon Business Association, we've actually supported two increases on corporate tax profits. We have a corporate tax rate uh, in the state of Oregon. That's actually how you would tax the companies that Ben mentioned and others is a corporate profits tax. You only have to go six words in to get to the word sales, because that's what this is. It's obviously a, there's four ways to tax consumption globally. Europeans use a more value-added VAT tax approach. Most states in America use a sales tax, 45. You have a few states, Ohio does the CAT, a commercial activity tax, and then you have a few states who have a gross receipts tax. That's obviously what this is, it's a gross receipts tax on sales. Now what most states in America that have gone that direction, but you have to be willing to give up revenue to do it, and I think that's really what's behind this measure is the desire for a massive amount of revenue, is the first thing you have to do, and it's just the humane thing to do to eliminate, because these tend to be highly regressive taxes. Oregon obviously has the great tradition and the grand tradition of being always in the top three states in America on progressivity of our tax system. So we're always, it's New York, Oregon, Hawaii, or always somewhere we, we ask those at the very top to pay the most in this state compared to just about any state in America. And we've largely rejected regressive approaches. Um, obviously this would be the biggest departure, most radical departure from that philosophy that Oregonians will ever have entertained. Um, the first thing, obviously any consumption-based tax is gonna be regressive by nature because we all buy uh, meals at the pepper mill, and milk, and electricity, and medicine. Uh, this is the only one that we can find, and then most states, there's a few southern states that are not as aggressive on uh, exempting the basic necessities. This measure does not exempt one of them. So milk, food, gas, electricity, all of those have not been exempted, and so this this proposal, IP28, will be in the Legislative Revenue Office that scores these. They've already given us the initial word of what this will do to low and middle income families in Oregon, but it'll be the, by far, who gets hit hardest, and it's obviously common sense, of who spends a greater portion of their income on milk, on bread, on medicine. And so seniors on a fixed income will have to absorb, because $5 billion plus Simply, and if folks believe, and I'll give one example of how it cannot work, but if folks believe that a utility or others are not going to simply pass on those costs to Oregonians, when they do in every single other state in America through a consumption base, we just pay it. Um, there's got to be a car dealership somewhere uh, because that's just, five billion is not going to descend upon Oregon for all these uh, important causes. And the, the one easy example that we all know of is our utility bill. It is mandated by state law. They have no option. They have to pass on the costs. And so that's just the easy example of how they will absolutely pass on. And I would direct you to the Legislative Revenue Office because they've done the initial analysis. They'll do a further one. But they'll just do one box that shows, here's how this would hit a family of or an individual taxpayer making 250,000. Here's how this tax, IP28, would affect someone making 100, 50, 25, 20, and down. And you will see in one box the most regressive, hardest hitting tax on low and modern and, and working class families in Oregon that we've ever looked at. And that's how you derive five billion plus and you exempt nothing. So you exempt every transaction, and, and in this one, it's a cascading tax, so it's a tax upon a tax upon a tax. And so because it was presented that this is not going to affect us, I'd like to use the restaurant that we're sitting in as a good example. 
they, small businesses, will get hit by far the hardest by this because they spend, they're working on a small margin, and they buy all these. They obviously buy uh, utilities. And it, I would yield some of my time, I see Ben still here, to tell me somehow, some way, that a utility is not gonna pass that on to the pepper mill. It's not, unless you're gonna change state law with it, uh, they, ha they are mandated. Plus a grocery store that runs on small margins. How are they, that we know that our small businesses pay such a, gr a greater percentage of their income than the largest corporations on earth on these basic business to business transactions of Cisco, which I'm sure supplies this pepper mill restaurant. CISO will pass on a transactional tax that is a tax, so it's at every part of the transaction. And that's why this is a more aggressive, and you get to these numbers that in previous appearances um, with the proponents, that's where you get a five billion, as they've called it game changing, it is, it's game changing. Um, because no state, and we can't find any example of this type of per capita tax increase on Oregonians and on consumers. Uh, the second part of, the problems that we see with this measure is it comes uh, with no plan. And so I think Representative Barker might uh, agree with this, is that absolutely if you gave, at least in my time in the legislature, you gave me five billion plus blank check with no plan. I wish I could say, and it was one of the more disappointing parts of um, the 10 years that I spent in Salem was that money, oftentimes you think, oh, we're gonna get this to, re to go to class size, so we're gonna reduce tuition. But the political horse trading that you see in Washington, D.C. certainly exists in our state capital, and the fact that there was no plan of how the dollars would be disseminated, it really does, obviously, cart and horse. You develop the plan, you have a strategic plan, and then you see what investment is necessary to meet those strategic goals, and obviously through an initiative process. And that's just my own personal, it's not one of the four main points, but this is what you get when you do these take it or leave it, no holds barred initiative ideas that I don't think have served this state well for the last two decades, is you get these kind of false choices, and the proponents of already, and even in this last special session down in February, are already saying, we'll change it. Uh, don't, don't look at that part of it. We're gonna change that part of it. Um, they were down in, in Salem, it didn't happen, trying to change a part of an IP. So they were already walking back from parts of the initiative trying to get the legislature to make one change that affected software companies here in Oregon. And so that's what you get with an initiative system, unlike the legislature where you have tax experts, you have hearings, you have public hearings, and you have a process to go through ideas. You get these take it or leave it and the chief petitioners and the proponents standing before you saying, well, just ignore, ignore that part of it, ignore this part of it, we're gonna change that, just vote yes, and we'll, we'll, we'll clean all these other problems up with it later, just trust us. Um, the, the third and I guess final point, Rob, that I would make before, if we have time for questions, is uh, the point that, and I think we made it, and I think some of the questions made it, that this isn't gonna affect Oregonians and small business. Uh, and I think we just have to agree that the nonpartisan legislative revenue office is, will graphically illustrate, and that's why I hope Oregonians really do dig in, get a copy of IP28, read it, and see the pretty astounding effect this will have on our families, on our consumers, and on small business here in Oregon who purchase these items. Uh, and with that, I think I'll wrap up, and thank you for your time, and it's great to be back with so many familiar folks. Mr. Deckert, Ryan, thank you very, very much. Folks, again, if you didn't buy a membership before and you need to, anyway, you know all that. So please line up and help yourself to questions. And we have Jim right now. Ryan, please. Yeah, um, thank you. That's Would you talk to the mic? <laughs> Sorry. Um, Jim Cape, four members. Still some questions about Ben. I mean, he's a West County politician, bureaucrat, wannabe. I mean, it's so easy. I mean, no one's held accountable. I mean, who is going to pay for the schools? I mean, it's like no one's held accountable for the taxes going to schools, and then who's going to hold accountable the legislature for not just not filling back the money for the schools? So it's just using children as easy, cheesy, pandering PR props, and that's just really not professional. Thank you. 
Thank you. And as a West County, I don't know how I fit in, but I might be some of those uh, <laughs> definitions. Uh, well, we hope the folks that hold them accountable is this, is that I, I really fundamentally believe um, that as voters learn more about IP28, not just whether you like the initiative process in general or not, but as you dig deeper into a really incredible, and it's why we're debating this in February and March when the election's not until November, is I think everyone in the state senses something big is at, at hand here. Um, and I think you're just gonna find that the more people read and learn, the more folks are gonna have real, real reservations about supporting this approach, and in particular, this ballot measure. Harry Bodine, Hi, Harry. member. Uh, two quick questions. I've heard five billion, I've heard two billion, I've heard one billion, so how much is this, how many billion per year? Number one. Yeah. Oh, uh, Harry, it's, so it's five billion, 5.2 a biennium, so it's over two and a half billion 2. a year. 5, and a 17, you know, the whole budget discretionary is around 17 billion for two years. So that gives you some size of the tax increase we're talking about. Five billion versus, uh, I don't know, Jeff, uh, 17, 18, 17, 18 billion discretionary budget. Number two, what is, what, what, any understanding of what this will do to employment? People will not be hired or not, or maybe they will be. Yeah, I mean, we, we obviously, you know what small business, when they're, when they're working on a high, and you just raise their costs, you know exactly how that affects small business, is they have to make decisions about adding staff, what they pay staff, and, and depleting staff. But interestingly enough, I really do defer to, because it's nonpartisan, it's not, it doesn't have an at stake. They're the ex, they're our economists for the state. They've already started projecting the employment loss that this would bring with it. And it obviously, it is not those big global brands that are gonna lay off people in Bentonville. It's, it's companies here in Oregon, and it's Oregonians who are um, gonna lose, because consumers, when you have five billion less, you have collectively, your ability to do discretionary items like go out to a nice meal, buy a nice bottle of wine, things that Oregonians, as the economy's been recovering, you have less of that, and so that flows through the economy, and that's where we get the negative employment numbers um, that the LRO will have. Do I get a third shot? Oh. Go ahead. <clears throat> Let's see, number three. <laughs> Let me think about this for a second. Um, I'm having a moment here. Just, mm -hmm. I'll come up with it. <laughs> Rob Solomon, member of the forum. This is not Harry's third, but I'm wondering, as I listen to, to both Ben and, and yourself, and appreciate very much you guys being here, I'm kind of struggling. Given your support for many of the concerns that Ben expressed, what does the state's business community want to do about sub-adequate education, seniors' issues, et cetera? You know, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, that, that, um, no, that, that is a very good question. Um, so we sat down, we spent $300,000 of our own collective resources with Governor Kitsap. I know, know he is now departed. Um, trying to think through what would be a balanced approach that we could do, that we could actually pass in the legislature. Um, we were behind, now it is not a five billion, um, it, which is a pretty jaw-dropping number. Um, but I think we've shown the, the ability and the propensity to get behind, and I think we've done it as recently as this last year. Ideas that we think are balanced, that actually, to Harry's point, when you score them on the revenue office, they actually produce jobs. So you, there are ways to make changes that, that yield greater investment in our education system, greater investment in our higher education system. You obviously have to exempt out, if you're gonna go consumption route, we would be the first one to say, exempt out the basic commodities of life, milk, electricity, gas, medicine. Um, so you're gonna give up revenue when you do those things, when you start taking things out. But we, we have absolutely, and we've told the proponents, and we've told the governor just recently, that we would absolutely sit at any table if they will remove this uh, initiative from the ballot, which we will sit, we will get right back to the table trying to think through what could we actually pass through the legislature and defend if someone actually tried to refer it and say we're behind, the business community of Oregon's behind this proposal. This will be a quick one. <laughs> Are there any business organizations in this state supporting IP28? Oh no, no, no. 
<laughs> no. I mean, seriously, are, are there anybody out there on the business side in favor of it? You know, I think you'll always get a few individual businesses uh, that would, would support them. But uh, I'm, no, Harry, because this came from really from a place that no one even expected. When I, I can tell you, I personally, I grimace. I couldn't believe it when I saw this $5 billion. Um, I mean, folks in this room know. I'm Democrat. I was chair of the finance. We actually did some revenue raising in my time there. This is so far out of, I think, commonly discussed proposals uh, that I think that's the reason you see such a unified and early opposition, because this is just a bridge too far is too kind of a term for, I think, the direction folks are trying to take us. Chris Leslie, forum member. Good to see you, Brian. Thank, you, Thank you for being here. Yeah. Do you have any idea of the best way to solve the school problems? Yeah, I mean, in general, the the, the avenues that we've supported, that I, I certainly supported, and the organization that I represent and businesses supported is, you do need to, Oregon has high, high income taxes. We have no consumption tax. Um, a, a, good change to Oregon's tax system would be to have some form of a modest con base consumption tax. Usually those come in the form of a just sales tax. That doesn't poll great, so this, that's where you get these, IP28, which is, you put, the, you put it in the sixth word, not the first. And so some sort of change to our income tax based structure that would introduce consumption, but not do it in the way that IP28 does, which is a tax on a tax on a tax. And there's ways that you can protect the, the most modest and middle income, working families, small businesses. And that, frankly, is a real, real problem with this. I think they went for such a big revenue target that they had to throw everyone into the pond, irrespective, to hit a pretty astonishing number of $5.2 billion per biennium. Statement. <laughs> I thought of a question too. <laughs> so, so first off, the question is for Rob. Um, did you notice that Ben Unger did not listen to uh, the talk? Uh, ben stayed for a while. He did let us know that he had to do it shortly after 12.30. I'm not pretty sure why we're discussing that. But it's, 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 I just thought it was rude. Uh, thank you for your yeah. right, the, And then the other, the statement, the comment was, um, if you note, there are a few business leaders that have endorsed IP28. You can go to their website and find them. Uh, none of them have revenues over $25 million in Oregon. Eric Squires, Forum Curmudgeon. First, Ryan, thank you for your service to the public. I'm grateful and appreciative of that. Um, there was a, a gorilla in the room that I'd like to name, and that's PERS. And that I heard a lot about children and funding schools, and a very good reason to raise taxes is because of a statewide obligation to address the PERS issue. So I really haven't made a decision on IP28. That's up in the air, and I think it, as, as you've hinted, that it may mutate, and before it really gets to a point that I can read about it to determine the merits of it, it may change a little bit. Could you speak on behalf of how you, as a representative of the business community, have solutions for these two competing growing interests? One would be funding schools. Um, and I'm wondering if I could prompt you, is there a way we could do more with less money there? And what is the business community's solution for the looming PERS crisis? Could you address those issues for me? Um, yeah, sure, of course. Uh, so uh, you are absolutely correct that we are about to, and I think that's somewhat of the motivation that is why you see such a big, big number, is that the Supreme Court decision on PERS is going, the rates are going to go up very high, very fast, um, not this year, but next year. And so that is going to have, we're talking billions, not hundreds of millions, because um, you're going to have, if nothing happens, um, some of our school districts, uh, fire districts, police, their employer rates, the first 25, 30 cents on the, a taxpayer dollar is going to go to to make that payment. And that is going to put stress on all of us as Oregonians. And we all have a stake in this. We have a Supreme Court ruling. And so we're eager after this 
this idea is settled, and we hope it is settled with a no, to get to a more balanced solution about, because th these are our communities, absolutely. I mean, those are, whether police, fire schools, community colleges, these are important, vital public institutions. And so we're eager to, to get to the table on how do you find a balanced solution that probably is gonna entail greater revenue, but it also look at the other side of the ledger, which we obviously heard zero about, and I can guarantee you there are things that you could do, absolutely, and it needs to be a balanced solution that looks at both sides of the ledger, both the revenue side, like any family or business or church would do, but also looks at the spending side as well, and looks at how do you balance those two, and that's obviously the problem with these take it or all initiatives. They just say, nope, $5 billion, and I think you kind of heard, and it's free. I mean, in this amazing, just $5 billion is just gonna descend here on, in Oregon, and we're, we get to spend it. Uh, we would look for a much more balanced solution. Can I follow up on that very briefly? <laughs> uh, thank you for entertaining the follow-up. Um, on, uh, uh, on the side of the ledger where we're um, um, incurring these costs, let me circle back to Purse and ask this. Would you as a representative of the Oregon business, business community support a court-mandated cram down of PERS in order to bring the PERS cost in alignment? So in other words, if the Supreme Court says, you know, great, it's a contract, but the state of Oregon can't raise taxes this much in order to fulfill the contract, so we're going to rejigger the contract and use retirees get less, is that something that the business community would support in order to balance the equation of raising less taxes uh, or raising taxes less in order to come in to an equilibrium to at least pay these retirement recipients uh, a closer amount to what they're uh, uh, what they should receive under their contract. Is that question clear? <laughs> I, I'm sorry. It was, it's the best I can do to keep it concise. Yeah, I mean the way that we would approach it is is you have to look at the total, especially with the court decision, which is basically guarantees a contract is a contract, nine votes. So. Um, because we were involved, obviously, in the reform that, that courageous legislators actually, and one of them sitting here, made very tough votes uh, to make. And so I honor the, the vote that those folks took. Um, I think you have to look at, as a balanced solution with revenue, is you have to look at the total compensation. Oregon, obviously, our public sector employees, and I think of my kids' teachers. <laughs> like I'm like I I love these, um, in this case, ladies, the the three the three women. Um, but we do have the third highest in total public sector comp compensi compensation. So in the country, we have the her third highest total. And so that has to be, frankly, part of it. Because when you get to the, the education question is a good one of why do we have, we're 23rd, so we're a little above the national average in K through 12 spending per pupil. And Beaver and probably even a little better. But yeah, we do. We have one of the third shortest school year in the nation. Some of the highest class sizes, not quite 40, 44. But given those rates, so why is that? It's obviously, um, there's a funding component, but there's also how do we allocate those dollars to get the biggest bang for students. Um, and sometimes we don't choose the length of the school year, which we know international standards would say you should be choosing that first. And so we think that's the balanced solution that comes when you don't say yes to a five billion plus tax on consumers, because you're not gonna get that conversation. You're gonna get a massive infusion of dollars with no accountability. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Tim Hutchinson, former member. Uh, great presentation. I liked your answers and so forth, but I have an, a question which wasn't clear to me, and because uh, it was kind of astounding. Uh, do you agree with the other speaker that uh, these corporations, that we're 49th in uh, the tax rate for these corporations? And uh, if so, uh, what do we do to get these corporations to pay their fair share? Yeah. Um, great. Great question. It's interesting to me that the people who used to ask me tough questions are now the ones that are agreeing with me uh, <laughs> vociferously here at the forum. Uh, the way that you, the reason that Oregon is going to rank, um, although it, 
most businesses are organized as S corps. So they pay that 9.9, .9, which is obviously the second highest in the nation. I would almost guarantee without knowing it that the business that we're sitting in right here and most of Lorraine's members are S corps, which is they're paying that high, that, that highest rate. But the reason that C corps is we have no consumption tax. So you'll find any state in America that has, any of the states that have no consumption taxes are gonna have lower C corp rates. And so their solution, which is introducing consumption, but knowing who pays consumption, obviously, is all of us as consumers. And the Revenue Office will just illustrate this vividly of how we all pay it. But that's how you get business to pay, because it's all those business to business transactions that, we, that they make is how you capture. Um, Yeah, if you read the Tax Foundation's report, they rank the states, that's what you will find, is, is it, those with the highest consumption taxes tend to have the highest business taxes, and they tend to be predominantly in the South, because they have high, high consumption, low, low income. Um, they also have the highest business taxes, because they're capturing every business transaction, rather than the way we do it, which do, does it on corporate profits. You guys are taking your, your stuff down. <laughs> <laughs> We're taking it down because the only speaker left is me. <laughs> Ryan, thank you very, very much. I appreciate your presentation and answering questions. If you have a few moments as we're going to end in just a few seconds, we're going to start a board meeting, but there may be a few people that might want to grab you and ask you a few questions. Folks, I did want to take a moment to thank Representative Barker, if you'll wave, to, for attending. And also, well, granted, we're always happy to see our first vice president, but we have Congresswoman First right over there, if she'll wave too. And it's a great segue because not only are we pleased to have the Congresswoman on our board, but for those of you that are looking for something to do on Tuesday, April 5th at 7 o'clock, Cedar Mill Library. Congresswoman first will discuss, well, frankly, involvement in politics, and we're hoping some younger folks will be there, as well as some of the, some of the folks that have been around a little bit longer. We're going to learn some of the secrets of how to get elected. Actually, she hasn't I haven't told her that, but it should be a very exciting and wonderful talk, an opportunity to have one-on-one -on -one conversations afterwards, I'm sure, with the Congresswoman as well. So thank you for doing that. And those of you that haven't put it on your calendar, I'm sure you've got a device that can help you. Next week, on March 14th, we have Matt Davis from Washington County Department of Health be talking about wood smoke abatement. Uh, topic that's pretty darn serious in Washington County, if not elsewhere. On the 21st, we have Lucy Baker, who's the administrator for the Oregon Advocacy Commissions, be discussing basically how advocacy works in Oregon. Uh, and on the 28th, Cheryl Lee Burton, when she comes here, she'll tell me how to pronounce her last name appropriately, but it's a B-E-R-T-G-E-S, from the Oregon Beverage Recycling Co uh, Cooperative, and she'll be telling us about the recycling changes. And just go into April a little bit. On April 4th, we'll be having Gene Atkins, our Secretary of State. I just want to tell you that right after the 4th, we'll start moving into the election cycle, and we'll be having an awful lot of the candidates for the various races. The nominations close tomorrow, so we've been unable to schedule. Starting tomorrow, we should be scheduling a number of interesting April and early May meetings. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for attending today. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. <laughs>